really do not have to go very far. Regardless of where you are in the world, all we need to do is to just look around us to see how different people are from each other. People come in all shapes and sizes, men and women, young and old. The question is, how does all this variability affect the way we use medicines? Does it and should it affect the way we prescribe medicines? Hi, I'm Edmund Lee. In this session, what I want to do with you is to take you through some of the insights and perspectives as to what drug response variability is all about. So keep watching. Don't go away. Back in 400 BC, it was Hippocrates who pointed out that it was far more important to know the person behind the disease than the actual disease that the person has. Likewise, just over a hundred years ago, the Canadian physician Sir William Osler noted that it was because of this great variability that exists between individuals that medicine was very much more of an art than a science. Of course, nowadays, this ability to recognize the variability between individuals has become much more of a science than an art. Now consider this young lady with a very bad bronchitis, most probably from a haemophilus infection. She was prescribed a standard textbook dose of ciprofloxacin. Now, Given what we know about the variability that exists within the population, the question is, is the dose appropriate for her? If the dose is too small, there's a risk for drug resistance to develop in the bacteria. On the other hand, if the dose is too large, even though the risk is very, very small, there's a risk of sudden cardiac death developing. There is a misconception that variability in drug response is really just all about outliers. And this is not the case. This is not to say that outliers are unimportant. In fact, they are very important because they are an integral part of our consideration of drug response variability. Many of the outliers that we identify are actually pharmacogenetic variants. And we need to pay special attention to this. What I'm trying to point out here is that we need to look beyond the outliers to look at the variability that may exist within the normal distribution. Let's take a look at this frequency distribution of heights in the bunch of army conscripts. All our scientific and statistical training teaches us to describe this population in terms of the mean and the standard deviation. And this is fine, but we find in so doing that actually our attention is drawn to the mean or the central tendency of this distribution, very simply because there are so many people there. But what we don't realize is that in so doing, we actually miss out important information which is actually occurring at the tails of the distribution because this is where the problems actually occur. And since this is a frequency distribution affecting heights, then we would imagine that actually at the tails of the distribution, you might actually have individuals who have problems getting appropriately sized uniforms. You have the same kind of problems when you're dealing with drug response variability. Say in this instance, we are looking at the pharmacokinetic parameter area under the plasma concentration time curve, or AUC, which we know represents drug clearance. And we do a frequency distribution of the values in the population obtained after a standard dose of the drug. And we get a normal distribution. But we find our eyes once again drawn inexorably to the center of the distribution. This is normal. But we must understand that in doing so, actually we lose sight of important things that are happening at the tails of the distribution. For example, in the left tail of this distribution, you have individuals with increased chances of poor clinical response because their AUCs are so much lower than the average. 
By contrast, in the right tail of the distribution, you have individuals with increased risks of toxicity because their concentrations are so much higher than the average. By and large, the average responders who are in the center of the distribution have no problems with the standard dose of the drug. Now let's take a look at this very interesting frequency distribution. Once again, it's about a group of military conscripts, and we're able to describe this group in terms of the average height of the group, as well as the standard deviation of that height. It's an interesting distribution because actually it doesn't show you that there are actually subpopulations in this group. For example, there are women on the left and the men on the right. And if our eyes, as before, remain focused only on the central tendency of this distribution, we'll miss the fact that actually the tails of the distribution are almost exclusively for women on the left and for men on the right. Which means to say, if we are dealing with the problem of finding suitable uniforms for this group of uh, conscripts, that women have a specific problem as compared to men. And if we are able to develop more specific frequency distributions for women and men, as shown here, we actually find another very interesting problem, that the previous frequency distribution with its average and standard deviation inadequately represent either women or men. In other words, that frequency distribution is relatively meaningless because it cannot be applied to either gender. This is a representation of the same principles applied to drug response variability. And once again, we are looking at the pharmacokinetic parameter area under the curve. And we find that the AUC uh, developed by women following the standard dose of the drug are actually quite different from the AUCs developed by men. Now, overall, this representation illustrates two very important principles. Firstly, it is important to be able to identify the subpopulations within the larger population base. If we had just relied on the average developed in a mixed population of men and women, that average would completely misrepresent what is happening among women and what is happening among men. The second principle that we need to consider is that we need to look at the tails of the distribution. And now we examine the tails of the distribution, we find that the uh, left tail of the distribution is almost exclusively women, and the right tail of the distribution is almost exclusively men. Which means to say that for women, uh, they might have a higher chance of failure in therapy because the areas under the curve are so much lower than the average. And for men, because the AUCs are so much higher than average, they might have a higher risk of toxicity. So the take-home message here is this. Don't just look at the central tendency of the distributions, and we must pay particular attention to the tails of the distribution because this is where therapeutic problems usually occur. Now let's consider the problems of drug response variability, when we have a situation where the drug is developed within one population and then it's exported and marketed to be used in another population, and there might be differences between these two populations. So what are the implications of this drug response variability for global drug development and marketing? Let's think about it. Now here's a frequency distribution of the platelet response to a standard dose of clopidogrel given to patients. Then you find in this frequency distribution that most of the patients actually have a reasonable response to clopidogrel, ranging from 10 to 50% platelet inhibition. But what is alarming is that if you look at the far right of this distribution, you find that there are actually patients with an excessive inhibition of platelets, uh, ranging from 60 to 70% uh, inhibition of platelets. Now this is alarming because in these patients, because of the excessive inhibition of platelets, they might actually have an increased risk of uh, bleeding. Now, if you look at the left of the distribution, you actually find that actually there are some patients here on the left uh, with less than 10% uh, inhibition of platelets. Now, effectively, in these patients, uh, 
they have no clinical response or no clinical benefits to the use of clopidogrel. Now, if you look closely at this distribution, on the far left of this distribution, you find that there are actually patients with negative values in terms of the change in platelet aggregability. Now, what does this mean? In these patients, there might actually be an increased uh, activity of platelets after having received a platelet inhibitor clopidogrel. In the terms of the clinical response, these patients may actually have a hyperthrombotic state when they are being treated with uh, platelet inhibitor clopidogrel. And this is problematic because here you have patients with an increased thrombotic state, uh, which is really the kind of thing that you're trying to prevent when you're using the drug clopidogrel. So when you look at all this, you realize that just giving a standard uh, drug clopidogrel, which should be a relatively simple exercise, you find that you actually have a wide range in terms of the variability in the response to this particular drug. And this variability does need to be considered and recognized and we must learn how to deal with this variability in the clinical response. Take the situation where there are two population groups, A and B. Now, these two groups might be actually from the same country, but just of different ethnicities, or they might be from the same country, but just happen to be separated geographically. Or they might possibly represent a situation where A is the country where the drug has been developed and where dosage requirements have been defined. And B is the population where the drug eventually is marketed to and where the drug is to be used. Now, there is a real pharmacokinetic difference between uh, populations A and B. And the parameter that we might look at might be the area under the plasma concentration time curve, or AUC, uh, which for all intents and purposes would represent the clearance of the drug. And the magnitude of this difference, which is about 25%, is not particularly large. And most pharmacokinetic studies might not actually be powered to, uh, to detect a difference of this magnitude. And therefore, if we just concentrate on the means of the distributions and the differences between the means, we might be tempted to overlook this real difference. But we should look at the tails of the distribution. And in this particular instance, just focus on the right tail of the two distributions. If we assume there is an empirical toxicity threshold, which theoretically is set at plus two standard deviations uh, from the mean of population A, you can see that the areas under the two curves that are beyond this toxicity threshold uh, are actually quite different between the two populations. And the percentages of the population who have values exceeding this threshold are actually therefore quite different. Under population A, the percentage of, pop, of the population that actually have concentrations above this threshold is about 2.3%, as compared to for population B, where the percentage of the population is about 15.9%, which are who are above the uh, toxicity threshold. And this suggests that the risk of developing toxicity in population B might be as much as seven times higher than population A. Now let's push this model a little bit further and let's say if the toxicity threshold is now set at three standard deviations uh, above uh, the mean of population A, we can see that the areas under the curve have now uh, shrunk considerably. So in absolute terms, the number is actually very small. But in percentage, uh, relative percentage terms, this is quite an interesting uh, development because in the under population A, you find that only 0.14% of the population have values above the toxicity threshold. And this is compared to 2.3% uh, in population B. Now, as I said, the absolute terms uh, are actually relatively small. But then in relative terms, population B actually has 16 times higher uh, amount of patients who have uh, values that are beyond the toxicity threshold as compared to population A. And it suggests that population B might be 16 times 
at higher risk compared to population A. Now this is significant. What is often not appreciated is the variability of uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of a drug actually increases through its life cycle. This is not because the molecular characteristics of the drug actually changes, but very simply because the population to which this drug is exposed to actually increases through its life cycle, and the variability correspondingly increases. For example, during the clinical trials development phase of the drug life cycle, the types and numbers of patients that a drug is exposed to is very limited, and therefore it appears that the variability is very small. But as the drug enters the marketplace, it is increasingly exposed to a larger variety of patients, and therefore the variability increases. And this is very often associated with changes in the efficacy toxicity ratio of the drug. Very often, this efficacy toxicity ratio takes a dip as the drug proceeds through the later phases of this life cycle. So much so that the efficacy toxicity ratio of a drug towards the later part of the life cycle is very much lower compared to when it first began its uh, story. In some instances, these changes actually proceed relatively quickly and early on in the life cycle of the particular drug, so that the efficacy toxicity ratio drops to alarming levels. And this is very often uh, a cause of the market failure of the particular drug. So we have come to the end of this presentation. I hope you have uh, enjoyed watching the video, but there's lots more to come. In other sessions, we'll be thinking about the uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic processes that contribute to this variability, and we'll take a closer look at uh, what all this variability in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics might mean for the overall drug response. So do keep following this video series.